Now listen to the talk and answer the questions one to six. Good morning. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to join the library. We're new to the district, you see.、Hmm, certainly. Well, all we need is some sort of identification with your name and address on it. Oh dear, we just moved, you see, and everything has my old address. A driving license, perhaps? No, I don't drive. No, your husband's would do. Yes, but his license will still have the old address on it. Hmm. Perhaps you have a letter addressed to you at your new house. No, I'm afraid not. We've only been there a few days, you see, and no one's written to us yet. What about your bank book? That's just the same. Oh dear, and I did want to get some books out this weekend. We're going on holiday to relax after the move, you see, and I wanted to take something with me to read. Well, I'm sorry, but we can't possibly issue tickets without some form of identification. What about your passport? What? Oh yes, how silly of me! I've just got a new one, and it does have our new address. I've just been to book our air ticket, so I have it on me. Ah, well, that's all right. Your ticket will be ready soon. Okay. Um, how many books am I allowed to take out? You can take four books out at a time, and you can also get two tickets to take out three magazines or periodicals. Newspapers, I'm afraid, can't be taken out. Oh, that's fine.、Uh, do you have a record library? Some libraries do, I know. Yes, we do. You have to pay a deposit of five dollars in case you damage them, but that entitles you to take out two records at a time. That's good. Could you show me where your history and biography sections are, please? Yes, just over there to your right. If there's any particular book you want, you can look it up in the catalogue, which you'll find just around the corner. You can also find a touchscreen information service on level two. Thank you. Oh. And how long am I allowed to keep the books for? Well, the normal loan period is three weeks, with two weeks extension. Oh dear, we're going away for four weeks. Can I renew them now?、Mm, I'm afraid not. You must do that at the end of three weeks. I see. Thank you very much. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen to the talk and answer the questions seven to ten. Well, let's go into some details. Your name, please, madam. My name is Barbara. The surname is Cooper. It's spelt as C O O P E R. Fine. And what's your contact number? If we have new books coming, we can contact you in time. Good. You can call me on seven two three six five one eight. But it's better after five p.m. You know I have to work during the daytime. Do you need the office number? I don't think so. It's enough. Could you tell me the address? I lived in King Road, but of course you need my new address. Um, it's twenty-five Saint Mary Road, Hanwell. That's H A N W E L L. Is that right? Yes. Do you need the passport number? I just brought it with me. Here you are. Yes, thank you. The number of your passport is G five seven nine eight zero nine four two. Okay, and your ticket is ready. The number is M nine three zero one two three. Thank you. Could I take a look around and check out some books? Of course, as you like. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute. To check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a conversation between a student and a driving instructor. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. Listen carefully. Hello, I'm going to be your driving instructor today. Are you ready to begin? Hi. Hope you don't mind. It's my first time driving a car. Of course not. That's my job. I teach people like you how to become a safe and responsible driver. So let's begin. Remember the most important rule of driving: safety first. There are some steps to follow. First, you should put on your seatbelt. You should always remember to do that. In case of an accident or emergency, having a seatbelt on is of utmost importance. Okay, I have my seatbelt on. Now, what should I do? Start the car. Good. Now make sure that the steering wheel is in the proper position, and that your seat is not too far or not too close to the pedals. I'm all ready to go. Should I shift into first gear? Don't forget to put the parking brake down. You don't want to drive with that up. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. If I have the parking brake on, I won't be able to accelerate. Yes, that's right. Now put the car in reverse and slowly back out of the parking space. Good. Put the car in first gear. When should I shift? Is it better to shift slowly or quickly? You can shift whenever you feel is appropriate. This means shifting should occur smoothly. Do not shift too slowly, or you will stall. Shifting too fast will waste gas. Shifting is simple. Just remember to shift smoothly. To shift, you will have to push the clutch and then push the gas pedal. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Remember, smoothly is the key to good shifting. Like this? Yes, that's good. Now keep it slow. Don't drive very fast just yet. Be sure to constantly check your mirrors for oncoming traffic. Always be aware of everything that is around you, including three important things. Remember these three. People crossing the streets, other cars, and bicycles riding next to you. What should I do if I see a yellow light? Well, it's always better to brake instead of trying to run it. But if you're travelling at a speed where it's impossible to stop in time, then you should try to make it across the intersection. But remember, you should always try to stop. It's the safest way to avoid an accident. Even if I have to brake very suddenly? Yes, even if you have to brake suddenly. What about if a driver behind me is going a lot faster than I am? You should always be ready to move to a slower lane if a driver behind you is forcing you to go faster than you are comfortable with. Never try to speed up to accommodate a faster driver. You could risk an accident or a speeding ticket. It's better to let him go. That sounds like good advice. Be careful. There is a sharp turn up ahead. Remember to brake before turns. Otherwise, you might flip over if your speed is too high going into a turn. Got it.
I know that I should always try to observe all traffic safety. That's right. If safety is not your first priority, it will make driving very dangerous for you and other drivers on the road. OK, park the car here. You did a great job today for your first day. I'll see you in three days. Thanks so much. I will see you then. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. So, what was it like in your school then, Lynn? Well, South African schools are very different from schools in Australia. For a start, children don't start their schooling until they are seven, quite a bit later than schools in Australia. What about New Zealand, Gail? We're more like Australia. I can't believe children don't go to school until they are seven. When do the parents get any free time? Well, there's still the availability of kindergartens or play schools. It's just that formal education doesn't start until later. I don't think it's such a good idea for children to have to be too academic at such a young age. They should be able to just enjoy themselves. Well, yeah, but the first school children go to isn't really very academic. It's just an opportunity for children to learn a few basic social skills by playing and learning with other children. Yes, I'd agree with that. I guess being so close, Australian and New Zealand schools must be similar then. Well, I suppose they do share a lot of similarities, but there are also some differences. For example, children in New Zealand go through intermediate school, but in Australia there's only high school. That's right, isn't it, Pat? Yeah, I think so. What about South Africa, Lynn? Do you have an intermediate or high school? Oh, high school. Now the difference between Australian and New Zealand education is that although both countries have state schools and private schools, our private schools are very often run by religious groups, whereas New Zealand schools are secular. That's not true. There are quite a few religious schools in New Zealand. Oh, OK. Maybe we are similar. Only a few South African schools have any religious connection, so I guess we're different. Most people go to state schools. Pat, is it true that some people from your country don't have to go to school at all? Well, that's partly true. Because of the geography of Australia, there are a lot of children who do not have access to schools, at least on a regular basis. Instead, they have a form of correspondence education, where the lessons are actually on the radio and the students send their work in by post. That way they get a lot of what they would if they were in the classroom, apart from the interaction. In New Zealand, not all students have to go to school either. Some parents have opted for homeschooling. Oh, is that like correspondence teaching? We don't really have that. Well, we do have correspondence schools, but homeschooling is different. With homeschooling, the parents teach the children and set them homework. They have to present a syllabus to their local education authority before they can do that, but it is becoming a more popular choice for some parents. I suppose it also suits parents' own commitments. I mean, they don't have to worry about collecting their children from school, and they can always teach over the weekend or in the evening if they want to. Is the school day normally quite long, then? Not in New Zealand, but I think it can be in Australia. Yeah, that's right. I think Australia is unusual in that there are extracurricular activities which you have to go to. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. These are normally sport activities, but there are a few other options. We have activities after school for any student that is interested, but they aren't compulsory. What about in New Zealand, Gail? I had to do some sport every week. I didn't really like it, but it was part of the school day, so I guess that's not so bad. Anyway, I spent two years at boarding school, so things were a little different. Boarding school? What was that like? Well, the thing I remember most about it was the strict dress code. There were restrictions on everything. You had to wear a school uniform almost all of the time, and it had to be cleaned and ironed. The length of your skirt had to be no less than one inch above your knees when kneeling down. Sometimes we used to go out on school trips or just at weekends with a few friends, but whenever we were outside the school we had to wear a hat. There was one teacher who always used to give me extra homework because my socks weren't pulled up, and that was in the school late in the evening. I suppose it wasn't that bad, but at the time it felt like a prison. I kept getting into trouble for something. Most of the time I forgot something, normally my school badge. We had to wear that all the time, in the school and out, because it had our house colours on it. Wow, that doesn't sound like much fun. No, but it was a good education, I suppose. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You're going to listen to a talk about tea in the UK. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. During the 1930s, there was a popular song which had the title Everything Stops for Tea, and to millions of British people, a restful cuppa is still an ideal way to relax for a few minutes from the rigours of the day. The English custom of drinking tea has its roots in the 17th and 18th centuries. When first imported to Britain, the exotic cha, cha, or cha, as the Chinese tea was variously called, was considered a man's drink to be enjoyed with colleagues at London coffee shops. These were popular meeting places for many walks of life, politicians, lawyers, poets, actors, and writers. Many London clubs began in this manner, and the famous Lloyd's Insurance underwriters started out as Lloyd's Coffee House. In 1706, the first coffee house that offered tea was Tom's Coffee House, owned by Thomas Twining. He realised that he needed to introduce an added attraction to compete with the many other coffee houses in London, and tea was rare, exotic, and extremely expensive. With these credentials, tea became an exclusive drink and enabled Twining to open a tea shop under the sign of the Golden Lion in the Strand. By the 18th century, the ladies of the more affluent classes were going China mad, using tea as an excuse for displaying their extravagant purchases of Chinese porcelain and Dresden tea sets. A comprehensive tea tray would consist of a teapot and stand, teacups and saucers, sugar bowl, milk jug and basin for discarded tea and tea leaves. Tea was still expensive and kept in locked tea caddies. 
skilled craftsmen fashioned caddies of carved inlaid woods fitted with crystal and precious metals. To ensure the servants weren't tempted by this priceless commodity, the caddy was kept locked, and only the mistress of the house held the key and prepared tea when guests came to visit. No well-brought-up young Englishwoman could consider herself socially acceptable unless she knew how to brew a proper cup of tea. As the 18th century progressed, changes in commerce and working hours resulted in the main meal of the day being taken much later in the evening. The prospect of lasting from breakfast until evening did not appeal to the Duchess of Bedford, who is usually credited with being the first to alleviate late afternoon hunger pangs by introducing a small four o'clock meal served with tea. With time, the light, wafer-thin toast or delicate white bread gave way to exotic fillings like tomato and egg, cucumber, chicken or potted shrimps, followed by buttered scones, crumpets or elegant pastries. The popularity of tea continued to spread, but it was not until 1839 that the first shipment of Assam tea, Indian tea was landed in Britain. A healthy trade with India was soon established, and tea clippers, like the Cutty Sark, now a museum in a dry dock at Greenwich, were reaching the peak of their sailing days. In 1879, the first limited shipments of Ceylon tea began to arrive, and by 1880, this had been firmly established alongside Indian and China teas, giving the broad range of teas that are available today. There have been few changes in three centuries of tea trading. London is still the centre, and indeed Twining still has a shop on the site of the original Tom's Coffee House at 216 The Strand. The name Twining has been linked with tea for over 280 years. Indeed, it was Richard Twining, in his capacity as chairman of the dealers of tea, who in 1784 persuaded Prime Minister William Pitt to reduce the high tax on tea, making the beverage more accessible to the general public. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.